It is now time for a question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. My uh, question to the Premier. Uh, Premier, one of the common issues I hear from parents is very concerned about their sons and daughters. Usually characterize it that their daughter has her university degree or college has son has a college diploma. And they thought by this time in life they'd be on their own, their own place, making their way in the world, their own career path. But they're back home with mom and dad. Instead of occupying a job, they're occupying the couch. They're getting frustrated with this province. When asked when you will produce your jobs plan on Friday, you told the media to ask you in six months. Premier, it is unacceptable to wait another six months after nine months of delay and ten lost years. Premier, when will we actually see your jobs plan tabled? These people cannot wait another six months. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I, uh, I just, want, I just want to put the comment in context because when I was asked, Mr. Speaker, the Youth Employment Fund, the $295 million that we are investing to put supports in place for young people, that fund had opened on September 23rd, Mr. Speaker. I was asked by the media a couple of days after, and I said, of course we want results, but it was a bit too early. In fact, Mr. Speaker, as of today, uh, the ministry, according to the ministry, there are 535 Youth Employment Fund placements across the province, 126 more more than anticipated. So, Mr. Speaker, in fact, the results are already coming in, and I anticipate we will hear more good news about that fund in the days to come, Mr. Speaker. You, supplementary. <clears throat> you know, Speaker, I remember when the PC government set the stage for a million new jobs in the province of Ontario, and we led North America in job creation. You know, frankly, Premier, we, we had agreed with you to. Uh, Waiting. Keep it down. Please finish. Uh, you know, Premier, we'd agreed uh, with you. You had suggested a number of bills. We agreed to pass those bills in a programming motion with the goal of clearing the deck so we could focus on jobs and the economy. The programming motion was tabled a couple of days ago, and your only response to date was to tell everybody to wait six months and then to launch a website, I guess, which was noplan.ca on the weekend. Premier, waiting six months is, a lot long, is far, far too long. Our plan is out there. I beg you, steal any ideas on our plan. Bring something forward. Actually put people Thank to you. work and entrepreneurs back in business and a problem. Thank you. Surely waiting to Thank you. Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, I remember when the PC government wrought havoc across this province in terms of our education system and our health care system, Mr. Speaker. And in fact, many of us are here because of the undermining of the contracts that we had in this province on terms of civil society that were that were really blown apart by the uh, the PC government, Mr. Speaker. So, what I what I would say to the member opposite is that we have a plan in place, and evidence of that, Mr. Speaker, is investment investment in the Ford plant, Mr. Speaker, 70.9 million dollars that we put in place to protect more than 2,800 jobs, Mr. Speaker. Our uh, introducing of the uh, Small Business Act that will help 60,000 small businesses by helping them with their payroll tax, Mr. Speaker. The Youth Employment Fund, Mr. Speaker, which I have already said today, is showing results. 535 Answer. placements across the uh, province, according to the ministry, Mr. Speaker. So there is much already underway. And, Mr. Speaker, our Thank ongoing you. connection with the people of Ontario is very Thank important. You. Final supplementary. Well, you know, quite frankly, Premier, these are all warmed over ideas that you stole from the NDP. And we saw what an incredible mess. But they're, they're, they're applauding that, but we know, we know what an incredible mess the NDP made of this province. They drove her economy in the ditch, and we're not going there again. Premier, no questions asked. Take any of our ideas. There's no charge. We actually want to get on with the job of creating jobs in the province of Ontario, and Ontario that's number one for jobs and last in debt and not the other way around. We put ideas on the table to get energy costs under control to make sure we lower the cost of doing business Minister by lowering taxes, to actually moving forward with apprenticeship reform so young people can get jobs in the trades in Ontario, not Saskatchewan and Alberta. Pick all three, pick one, but surely, Premier, pick something Question. that's part of the job. Let's get on with it. Let's move our province forward and create some jobs. Thank you. So, Mr. Speaker, here's what we're getting on with.
if, an, if, if the observers from the PC party at, the, uh, at our uh, uh, provincial council on the weekend had heard what I said, they would know that investing in people, investing in the infrastructure that's necessary, Mr. Speaker, and investing in a dynamic business climate, Mr. Speaker, that is the plan, that's the framework, that's what we're doing, and all the specifics, Mr. Speaker, fit. Shouting people down is not really what we should be doing here. Please. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I, I really, you know, I, I reject the notion that's coming from the other side that the driving down Cambridge wages with harmful order. legislation that would undermine all of the good work that organized labor has done for the last yeah. decades, firing 10,000 education workers, Mr. Speaker, and firing 2,000 health care workers. Mr. Speaker, that's not a plan. That's just a blueprint for destroying the Thank province you. once again. We're not going to go there, Mr. Speaker. You know, Parker, the leader of the opposition. You know, um, Speaker, well, uh, young women and men are, are facing a job market worse than the Rust Belt states. Um, well, the Premier's only response is to tell them to wait six months for her plan and to launch a new website, wehavenoidea.ca. She is rewarding. She is rewarding, however, the Pan Am executives and board members whose expenses, I'm sure the Premier will agree, are a wanton abuse of taxpayer dollars. Premier, you said you would be different. You said that you would not follow the same pattern of behaviour or the culture of entitlement of the Dalton McGuinty Liberals. Let me ask you then, Premier, when did you become aware of this abuse of taxpayer money at the Pan Am Games? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and I I agree with the uh, Leader of the Opposition that there are expenses within uh, that report that are unacceptable. And three weeks ago, the minister responsible for the Pan Am Games, Mr. Speaker, asked the board to review their policies, strengthen them where appropriate. It's unacceptable that public dollars would be spent in that way, Mr. Speaker. And my hope is that all the other two levels of government, both the city and the federal government, will take the same action, Mr. Speaker, because we have already taken action on tightening up those, those rules. Thank you, supplementary. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Premier, but with all due respect, doing another study is not taking action. Ending the free ride on the backs of taxpayers, that's actually taking action, and you should get on with that job. According to Pan Am executives, there was a provincial uh, audit. There's an audit done, supervised by the province, I think a number of months ago. So, and it says that they passed that audit. So I'll ask you this, Premier, will you table today the results of that provincial audit and then tell us exactly what you did when you found out about this extraordinary abuse of taxpayer funds? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I've already said the minister responsible for Pan Am Games has told the board that the, real, the rules need to be tightened. The, the, the rules were followed, but they need to be tightened up, Mr. Speaker, and that is what is happening. What I think we need to do is make sure that all levels of government, because all three levels of government are involved, Mr. Speaker, in getting ready for the Pan Am Games, we need to make sure that everybody is taking the same tack and that those rules are tightened. The Pan Am Games are going to be fantastic. The Pan Am Games are going to shine a light on this province, Mr. Speaker, on our talent and on the beautiful, the beautiful cities that, uh, that will host the different events. So, Mr. Speaker, we need to make sure that all the rules are tightened as the minister has asked, and we need to get ready Answer. for the best Pan Am Parapan Games ever, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Final supplementary. Um, we have the best hopes for the Pan Am Games and the Parapan Games. We know it can be a success, but it can't be. We can't have that kind of success when you see this kind of abuse of taxpayer dollars, expending anything from Starbucks uh, coffees to lavish trips and, and dinners for the executives. I mean, if they've reached that culture of entitlement two years before the Games take place, Speaker, how bad is it going to be in two years' time? So the test Order. is, Premier, um, what are you actually going to do about this? And I want to give credit where credit is due. My colleague, the member from Barry, Rod Jackson, has risen time and time again in this House to point out accountability problems. If your minister is AWOL, if you're not looking out for taxpayer dollars, then Rod Jackson and the PC caucus is prepared to do so. Will you join our call for the auditor to do a complete review of Pan Am expenses to make sure they're going to the right place and not this kind of thing? Will do that, Premier? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. You see it, please? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Premier. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. We've already taken action. The minister has already given instruction to the board to tighten the rules, Mr. Speaker. We are already reacting to what I agree with the, uh, the leader of the uh, opposition. The rules should be tighter. There should not be that kind of uh, entitlement. So we've already taken action, Mr. Speaker. You know, I think that we need to make sure that the, the dollars are spent wisely, that the, there's good judgment in place, and that the rules are appropriate. At the same time, Mr. Speaker, I hope that the leader of the opposition and the leader of the third party will join with me and join with the federal uh, government and with the municipal government to make sure that these are the best parapan pan games ever, Mr. Speaker, that we showcase Ontario in the very best light and that we involve people from all communities, Mr. Answer. Speaker, including school children who can be inspired by these fantastic athletes. Yeah. That's our objective, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. The member from Bruce Green on sound will come to order. Get the hint? No question. The leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Uh, when I met face-to-face -face with the Premier just weeks ago, she told me that closure motions that shut off debate weren't in her plans. Now the Premier is supporting a motion to shut down debate on a series of bills, including one custom-designed to help construction giant Alice Dawn, one of her party's Order. biggest donors. Why did she forget to mention that to me at our meeting, Speaker? Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. We did not have an explicit discussion about programming motions, and I think the leader of the third party knows that, Mr. Oh. Speaker. What we, what we talked about was our ability to move ahead, to get some legislation passed, on which there is agreement. And within the programming motion, Mr. Speaker, there is the opportunity for debate. There's the movement of bills to committee and lots of opportunity for, uh, for input, not just from members of the House, but from uh, people outside in the public, Mr. Speaker. So I think that what we have put forward is absolutely consistent with the conversations that I had with both the Leader of the Opposition and the Leader of the Third Party, where I said, you know what, where there's agreement, let's move this legislation ahead. There are lots of areas where there's disagreement, but let's try to move ahead where we can find that common ground. Mr. Thank Speaker. you. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, the Premier likes to talk about worthy bills being slowed down in the House, but the bill written for Ellis Dawn has sailed through the House past dozens of other bills with a fraction of the debate despite significant controversy. In our meeting, the Premier never once mentioned this bill. How did it suddenly become such a priority, Speaker? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, here's the reality, Mr. Speaker. There are three parties in this House. There's our party, there's the uh, Progressive Conservatives, and there's the NDP, Mr. Speaker. And so when I had a meeting with the leader of the third party, she's right. This particular bill didn't come up. When we met with the, uh, the, the leader of the opposition, Mr. Speaker, that is a bill that the leader of the, uh, that the uh, leader of the opposition wanted to put forward, Mr. Speaker. So the reality is that in a minority government, we need to work all of us together. And so I'm working with both the opposition and with the leader of the uh, third party, Mr. Speaker. And that's how that's how the particular mix of bills got into the programming motion, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. Final supplementary. Speaker, a lot of people have raised serious questions about the Liberals' eagerness to ram legislation through the House at the behest of a single, well-connected company. This issue is still being fought in the courts, but instead of respecting that process, the Liberals are working with the Conservatives in an undemocratic attempt to ram through changes at the behest of one well-connected company. Why won't the Premier respect the process and stop her undemocratic attempts to ram this bill through this House? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, I think, uh, I think the leader of the third party knows that all of the bills that are within the programming motion will go to committee. They will be subject to a vote, Mr. Speaker. This is a private member's bill that was put on the list of uh, bills that the opposition was interested in moving ahead on, Mr. Speaker. So I think to characterize a programming motion that's going to go through debate in the House, debate at committee, and debate in the House again, to characterize that as ramming, Mr. Speaker, I think is a really misrepresenta Order. a real misrepresentation of what's 
actually going to happen. Right. This is a bill that was put forward by the opposition, by a, a private member, and it is part of the overall programming motion, which includes, Mr. Speaker, many pieces of legislation that I know the leader of the Answer. third party and her members support. Thank you. Your question, the leader Speaker, of the third party. My next question is also for the Premier. Can the Premier tell us whether she or her staff discussed the Alice Don bill with the and universities or anyone working on behalf of that company in the last six months? Thank you, Premier. I'm, Mr. Speaker, I'm not sure of the scope of, her, of the uh, leader of the third party's question. What I know is that this is a private member's bill that was brought forward by a member of the, uh, the PC caucus. And, Mr. Speaker, there, within that programming motion, there are a number of pieces of legislation that I know that the leader of the third party and her members support. So, the, the Local Food Act, the, uh, the tanning bed legislation, Mr. Speaker, that will prevent cancer in young people, consumer protections, the wireless phone contract rules to help consumers. My hope is, Mr. Speaker, that the leader of the third party will be able to support those and doesn't think that we should drag out the process around those pieces of legislation because we all support them and we should move those ahead. The fact is, Mr. Speaker, that there was another private member's bill that was brought forward, but I hope that the leader of the third party will support those pieces of legislation that her members have already claimed they support. Thank you. Speaker, published reports indicate that the bill was crafted by lobbyists at Strategy Corp as a Conservative private member's bill, so it wouldn't look like the Liberals were violating collective agreements yet again. Can the Premier confirm or deny that report, Speaker? Premier. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I can't even follow the convolutions of that question. The fact is, Mr. Speaker, it's a private member's bill that the, uh, a member of the opposition has brought forward. My hope is that the leader of the third party will see that the pieces of legislation that we're bringing forward, so the Local Food Act, the, the tanning bed legislation, the consumer protections, Mr. Speaker, that she will understand that that programming motion is intended to deal with those pieces of legislation where we can find agreement, and many of them, there's agreement among all parties in the House, Mr. Speaker. So that was my objective in meeting with her and meeting with the leader of the opposition to find a way to move ahead those pieces of legislation where there was agreement. I think that's how minority parliament should work, Mr. Speaker. So I hope that she will accept that as these pieces of legislation go through, they will go to committee, Answer. there will be input, and they will come back to the House for a vote. That's how it needs to work, Mr. Thank Speaker. Thank you. Final supplementary. Speaker, when I met with the Premier two weeks ago, at the beginning of this session, the challenges facing Ellis Dawn weren't even on the agenda. At the time, the Premier actually agreed that the challenges facing families in this province should be our main priority. But now we see a bill championed by well-connected Liberal and Conservative insiders working on behalf of a company making billions of dollars annually Minister somehow for Rural become Affairs a top order. government priority. When is the Premier going to stop the excuses and the evasions and explain to people why she's making it her priority to help well-connected insider Liberal friends? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, our priority on this side of the House, Mr. Speaker, is to create jobs and light a fire under the economy by investing in people, by investing in infrastructure, and investing in a business climate, Mr. Speaker, that is going to bring business to this province and is going to create jobs. That's our priority, and that's what's happening, Mr. Speaker. I'm sure that the leader of the third party will be happy to know that already the $295 million youth employment fund is creating those jobs, is creating those placements. 535 placements, Mr. Speaker, and the fund only opened on September 23rd. So that's our priority. That job creation is our priority, Mr. Speaker, and we will stay our priority as we continue to work with the members of the opposition. Yes, your question? A member from Barry. Oh, she's from accountability now. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Premier, early in my business career, I learned to get the outcomes you want, you need to inspect what you expect. Premier, you permitted the Minister of the Pan Am Games to use taxpayers' money to write a blank check for all the needs and wants of the multi million dollar TO 2015 executive, including things like. Starbucks coffee, uh, uh, pet travel, travel for pets, Advil. Premier, talk is cheap. Will you remedy this today and ask them to repay all expenses that were made in bad faith? Yes or no? 
Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, let me just say, I have already answered this question. I've already said that the minister responsible for the Pan Parag Pan Games has instructed the board to tighten up those rules. But, Mr. Speaker, the, the member, hold on, the member of the opposition makes a very good suggestion. If there are expenses that are inappropriate and are not not within the rules and need. To Member from Bruce Gray Owen Sound come to order. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The, the member opposite makes a good point. If there, are, if there are expenses that fall outside of the rules that have not been paid back, then they should be paid back. I agree, Mr. Speaker. I give a supplement to that file. That's good. We're getting somewhere here, maybe today. Uh, Premier, it's important, you're right, that the uh, Pan Am Games sh shine the light on. TO not shine a light on the endemic waste that's going on on your government. Here, here. Premier, uh, the minister's credibility for the Pan Am oversight has diminished with one spanning scandal after another. The TO 2015 Organizing Committee executive salaries are greater than that of the Prime Minister, the Police Chief of Toronto, and the Mayor of Toronto. Plus, let's not forget the, the significant wow. bonuses they get just for completing their job. We don't even know what those numbers are yet. Then let's talk about the duplicate 62-person secret secretariat costing us an extra $2.8 million per year in administrative costs each year and counting. And the latest, unlimited expense accounts. Just what this government doesn't need, not what the people of Ontario need. Premier, will you allow the Auditor General oversight of your latest scandal-plagued portfolio? Here, here. Let's just be clear. I've already said that the minister responsible has talked to the board and has instructed that the rules be changed. And also, Mr. Speaker, let's remember that all levels of government, federal, provincial, and municipal, are involved in the administration of the, uh, the Pan Para Pan Games, Mr. Speaker. And let's also remember, Mr. Speaker, that this is a very significant investment of dollars and of energy into what will be job creation, Mr. Speaker. 26,000 jobs show showcasing Ontario as a place to visit, as a wonderful venue, Mr. Speaker. So this is an extremely important investment in the future of Ontario, and I agree with the member opposite that where there are rules that need to be tightened, they absolutely should be, and that's why the minister has already instructed the board to do so, Answer. Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Question, the member from Essex. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, last year the Premier told reporters, quote, I have never thought that we should legislate collective bargaining. Why is she now breaking that promise with the imposition of Bill 74? Minister of Labour, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker, and I appreciate the co uh, question from uh, the member opposite. I think, uh, in relation to the particular bill he's raising, I do want to inform the House, and I'm sure members know that uh, late Friday afternoon we received a decision, Speaker, uh, from the Divisional Court that looked into the decision of the Ontario Labour Relations Board uh, in relation uh, that has been raised in that particular bill. And in the review of that decision, the court uh, have quashed the decision of the Ontario Labour Relations Board. Uh, Speaker, we are, of course, closely, closely reviewing the decision. It was came late Friday, and uh, we'll have a better understanding of what that decision uh, means. But it seems like, at the moment, that the company can continue to operate under the status quo as per the de decision of the Divisional Court, Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. The Minister is right that the decision is uh, still before the Divisional Courts, but why intervene through this legislation? Why intervene? In collective bargaining rights, it, def it defies logic through this, this House. This special Ellis Dawn bill has the potential to completely negate hundreds of existing labour agreements which have nothing to do with that company. Does the Premier think that the interests of one major donor is so important that she's willing to ram through a bill that will help? the one singular company and negate hundreds of existing functional agreements between workers and employees. Speaker, so let me just try one more time and, and correct, correct the, the member opposite. The Divisional Court has rendered a decision. It came out late Friday afternoon. Uh, in that decision, the Divisional Court reviewed the decision of the Ontario Labour Relations Board that is subject to Bill 74. 
and have found uh, have quashed quashed the decision of the of the Ontario Liberal Relations Board uh, and and gives a pretty strong indication uh, that the status quo uh, as it relates to the company in question um, stays uh, intact. We are reviewing the decision. It came late Friday afternoon, and we'll have a better sense uh, in, in coming days as to the meaning of the decision. Thank you. Thank you. Question. New question. The member from Scarborough News River. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My, my question is to the minister responsible for seniors' affairs. Today is Older Adults Day at Queen's Park. Many seniors, groups, and advocates for, from Ontario are here to meet with local MPPs. Among those participating, I Member would like to Massa. specifically recognize those visiting from my riding of Scarborough Rouge River who are here in the gallery. I thank them for their work and advocacy. Speaker, one thing that I've been hearing from constituents in my riding is on the issue of safety and security for older Ontarians. Speaker, can the minister please inform this House of some ways this government is protecting seniors in Ontario? Question. Thank you. Minister responsible for seniors. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. Uh, through you, I want to thank the honourable member for his question. It is a good question. Uh, let me say, Speaker, that uh, uh, you, uh, Speaker, and every member in the House and the member from Scarborough Rouge River have the firm commitment of this government and mine as the minister responsible for seniors to uh, have our seniors live a healthy, safe and environment, whatever that may be, Speaker. Uh, and uh, with respect to the government, uh, we are the first one in Ontario and in Canada, Speaker, to introduce a strategy to combat elder abuse, uh, which the strategy aims, Speaker, to improve the coordination of community resources, to build capacity of frontline staff, and to increase public awareness as well. Uh, we have already committed and spent, invested, I should say, Peter, $8 million and $900,000 on a yearly basis. And for me, Speaker, doesn't matter where seniors live. They live in one Ontario, and they all deserve to be living Thank in you. confidence and in dignity. Thank you, Speaker. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. It is good to hear that our government is taking serious efforts to ensure seniors are being protected. As a matter of fact, I'm hosting a community health fair at Malvern Town Centre this Saturday. This information will be something I will make sure to pass along to seniors. Many seniors that I will meet this Saturday will want to know that they will be able to live in their own homes for as long as possible. Staying at home provides them the independence and dignity that they need and deserve. Mr. Speaker. Can the minister please tell us what this government is doing to ensure seniors are getting the care they need so they may remain living in their own homes? Thank you. Thank you. Minister? Uh, Speaker, the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Speaker, and thank you to the member for this very important question, one that touches so many of us. Speaker, one of the most important goals of our Action Plan for Health Care is to, is to help seniors stay at home with the right supports Make sure seniors have that opportunity because home is where we all want to be, Speaker. It's better than being in hospital or having to move to long-term care. So we are increasing funding to the community sector. In fact, Speaker, this year, a 6% increase over last year. That's $260 million more this year than last year. Speaker, 3 million more hours of personal support uh, worker care over three years. And we're investing in 30,000 more house calls by our doctors, Speaker. Our Healthy Home Renovation Answer. Tax Credit is helping seniors uh, retrofit their homes so they can safely live in them longer. Speaker, this means more Ontarians are going to be able to live where they want Thank to live, in their own home, for as long as possible. Thank you. Uh, New question? Um, Madam Premier, I have received a copy of the uh, TTC report uh, prepared by uh, CEO Andy Byford for the TTC Commission last week, and it, and it comments on your plan to put the, uh, the subway extension through Scarborough. And I, I hope that you and, and your caucus have had a, an opportunity to, to review this, this, this report, because there are several things in here that would tell anybody that what you're proposing is just not feasible or right. 
I'd like to quote some of the things from the plan, if I could. Firstly, slower operation. Because of maximum curves and maximum grades, there are six speed uh, reduction zones here where the train can only go 50 to 55 kilometers instead of 80. The increase, this increases overall trip and passenger time. Question. My question is also that there's, there's three to four hundred million dollars uh, not accounted for in the funding. And I want to know when you're going to meet with the TTC Thank and you. the Toronto Mayor to move forward with the Toronto Council plan. Thank you. Thank you. Premier. Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Speaker. Um, the engineers at both Metrolinx and TTC talk and work together week to week on a regular basis. Uh, I think that Mr. Byford was very clear that this is technically feasible. Uh, there is a great there is a great deal of work being done on looking at the different options and our report will be released. You'll notice in that report, Mr. Speaker, such basic things as ridership were absent and it is very early going. Also, a lot of the assumptions that the members, member opposite is making may not be entirely accurate. Uh, what we do have is a real critical need in the plan to stick to the existing Answer. plan and to go where people are, which is where the Scarborough Town Centre is, Mr. Speaker. And we will continue to work with the city and the federal government now that there is an appearance of Thank some you. funds there to complete the project. Supplementary. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, last uh, time I, I asked if they would please, if the government would please let us know when they plan to open their first subway station in Toronto. Now, I, I'd like to read from Hansard because it's an interesting answer they gave me. The minister said, we will shortly, within the next few years, have a better record than the party opposite. The next few years, Mr. Speaker, is very vague. It's not a fair answer for the opposition, and it's certainly not a fair answer for the citizens of Toronto. I want to know when they're going to open their first subway station. Uh, the score is 64 to nothing. They've been in power for 10 years, and it's about time they did something. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we are, we are about to open dozens of subway and LRT stations at an unprecedented rate across, across the DTHA, Mr. Speaker. Here, here we go back to the basic problem. We have a $50 billion, 15 project major move to deal with congestion. Mr. Speaker, this is unprecedented. This means that people in Scarborough and Etobicoke and North Toronto won't be waiting 40 minutes for a bus. They will get high-speed, high-quality transit that they waited for. They didn't get it when the party was opposite power. They didn't put a penny in. And, Mr. Speaker, the party opposite still in power has hardly funded it. We're funding 90 per cent of the big move costs. The federal government, 3.85 per cent. Our friends at City Hall Answer. appear like they're getting into the game for the first time. We welcome that, Mr. Speaker, and we'll work on them to accelerate not just one project, but all 15 and solve Thank a larger you. problem, Mr. Speaker. The question, the member from Timmins, James Bay. My question is to the Premier. Premier, John Duffy is a lobbyist with Strategy Group that is registered to work on behalf of Ellis Don. Mr. Duffy touts his close relationship with you on the Strategy Corp website, noting that he worked with you. Jeez. Um, noting that he worked on the Premier's leadership campaign last winter. On April 19th, he registered to lobby on behalf of Ellis Don. Has the Premier met with Mr. Duffy? And if so, did she discuss this bill? Premier. Mr. Speaker, it's it's, it's quite unbelievable that the New Democratic Party, which uh, put together, helped draft a motion of this House, which programmed the Financial Accountability Officer legislation, who voted for it, who voted for closure on it, are now upset because we're putting forward a similar programming motion dealing with eight bills in the establishment of a select committee on developmental services. Mr. Speaker, all the programming motion does is allow for debate and discussion 
in a program way as it would be put forward in a way which will allow a smooth passage but will allow debate and discussion there will be committee time on this bill that he's so concerned about there'll be time for amendments there'll be time for votes at all stages Who's mr speaker it's now? just a little bit passing Answer. strange that when it's the fao it's okay but when it's a programming motion with these eight bills suddenly their sensitive their sensibilities are offended thank you supplementary Back to the Premier, and hopefully I'll get an answer this time. The issue is, is that Mr. Duffy registered to lobby on April the 19th, and within days, that particular bill was custom-made for his client and was introduced into this House. And within weeks, it sailed past the vote with an enthusiastic support of the Liberal caucus. So I ask you again, will the Premier, I repeat, will the Premier tell us what meeting Mr. Duffy organized with you and with anybody else on your staff? Mr. Speaker, if it, they're all going to your leader's gala. If my honourable friend has questions about the particular bill, perhaps he should be asking the member from Lambton, Kent, Middlesex, who brought forward this private member's bill, Mr. Speaker. This private member's bill came forward. It had debate and discussion at second reading and a vote. And all this programming motion does, Mr. Speaker, is ensure that it is uh, addressed by a committee. There will be an opportunity, again, for debate, discussion, amendments, witnesses to come forward. Mr. Speaker, and the honourable member can ask all the questions that he wants. But as I say, Mr. Speaker, if he has a question about who met with who, perhaps he should address it to the member for Lambton, Kent, Middlesex. Thank you. New question, member from Mississauga East, Cooksville. Thank you, Speaker. You know, Speaker, if you've been out of a job and you're worried about where your next rent is going to come from, often a temp agency can be a lifesaver. They allow you to pay the rent and put food on the table while you wait for that permanent job. And there's another thing I've learned, Speaker, is that these temp agencies often provide something very valuable, that much sought after thing, Canadian work experience for new immigrants. Order. So they really do provide a very important service. However, Speaker, at the same time, I do hear concerns from my constituents about employment standards and health and safety issues that are facing them in the workplace. Member from Hamilton Mountain, come to order. And, Speaker, the fact is that the most vulnerable of our workers are the least likely to complain about these abuses, and so it's important for somebody like me to stand up on their behalf and ask question. questions. So my question to the minister is, what are you doing to ensure the rights of my constituents? Thank you. thank you very much, Speaker. I really do want to thank the member for asking a very important question, an issue that uh, I hear quite often about, and I want the member to know that her constituents can rest assured that we are, are out there as the Ministry of Labor in workplaces across the province, ensuring that workers know their rights and that employers are living up to their responsibilities. On the issue of temporary work agencies, I want to give special credit for the members from Brampton Springdale and the member from Brampton West for being tremendous advocates on this issue. In fact, Speaker, was the member from Brampton uh, West who brought a private member's bill in terms of regulating temporary work agencies back in 2006. And I'm very proud to say that our government in 2009 First, government, uh, first provincial government in Canada brought a specific law regulating temporary work agencies. And under the law, we've made sure that employees are not unfairly prevented from being hired directly by employers. Their agencies are prohibited from uh, charging fees to workers for such things yes, as sir. resume writing and interview preparation and requiring agencies to provide information to uh, workers about their rights Thank under you. the Employment Standards Act. Thank you, Speaker, and thank, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for that great answer. It's really good to know that our government has put in place all of these rules and regulations to protect our workers. However, Speaker, I do have to say that a rule is only as good as its enforcement. So if the Minister can tell me what his ministry is doing to make sure that these rules are being enforced. Thank, Thank you, you very Minister. much. Uh, uh, that enforcement is a very important question. I want to give credit uh, to uh, my predecessor, the former Minister of Labor, the member from Brampton Springdale, for actually initiating the first ever uh, blitz uh, for proactive enforcement in the temporary work agencies. Uh, as a result, uh, uh, our inspectors visited about 100 temporary work agencies and, and laid about uh, over 200 uh, work orders uh, to ensure that the law that we brought in 2009 is fully complied with. Uh, similarly, uh, Speaker, a few weeks ago I did a round table in Brampton talking to constituents along with the members from uh, Brampton Springdale and Brampton West. 
and assured them that we're doing everything in our power Answer. to inform constituents. In fact, we have information about temporary work agencies available in 23 different languages. I encourage uh, all to go to ontario.ca slash labor to get that information. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. A new question. The member from Perth, Wellington. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier and concerns the horse racing industry. That industry was devastated when, without warning, the Liberals pulled the plug out from under it. Shame. They then struck a panel of former politicians to clean up the mess it made at a cost of over a half a million dollars so far. A lot of money. This weekend, we learned that Woodbine Entertainment paid out $51 million in bonuses over 12 years. The Globe and Mail reports that the CEO is believed to have earned just over a, a million dollars last year. Speaker, the Liberals have been in office for 10 long years. Premier, why have you failed so miserably when it comes to enforcing basic standards of accountability? Thanks very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Our government believes in a strong, sustainable future for the horse racing industry in Ontario. Our plan is guided by the work that's being done by the Horse Race Transition Panel. The panel is led by three very honourable gentlemen, John Wilkinson, John Stobelin and Albert Buchanan. Premier Wynne has asked the panel to develop a comprehensive five-year plan. And Mr. Speaker, our government will continue to work with Ontario's great horse racing community to ensure that racing remains vibrant in the years to come. And I do have a quote from John Stoblin. Quote, SAR, SARP needed to end. Hundreds of billions of dollars in slot dollars had perverse effect in turning the industry away from its fans and customers. There is no doubt that is no longer doubt. John Stoblin, a member of the Horse Racing Transition Panel, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker. The issues at Woodbine took place right under this government's nose. Yep. Horse breeders themselves were raising questions which the Liberals ignored. Terrible. Obviously, they have no capacity for effective oversight. It's so much easier for them to just look the other way. That's right. Turn blind but the track. horse racing industry is much bigger than one racetrack. Instead of dealing with the issues at Woodbine, the Liberals targeted an entire industry. Wow. Talk about throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Yep. They deliberately jeopardized 60,000 jobs, mainly in rural Ontario. 9,000 of those jobs are already gone. My question is this. Why should 60,000 people have to pay the price for this government's own breakdown of accountability? You should be ashamed. Thank you. I'll wait. Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, as John Stobel had said, there was a lack of transparency. Member from Dufferin, come to order. And he has many members on the side opposite. The lack of transparency and accountability in this PC initiated slots and racetracks program is exactly why our the member from Northumberland come to order, the member for Simcoe North come to order, the member from Leeds Grenville come to order, and the member from Durham come to order. I've, uh, oh, I did. And so did the member from, I want the member from uh, Prince Edward Hastings to relax. Finish your answer, please. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'm, I'm quite shocked today that the former cabinet minister, Mr. Stoblin. Look, I, I, I'm not fooling around here. That goes for everyone. Answer, please. Mr. Speaker, I want to reiterate what Mr. Stoblin said again. Wrap up. SART needed to end. Hundreds of billions of dollars in slot dollars had the perverse effect of turning the industry away from its fans and customers. There is no doubt, one question is no longer doubt. Horse Thank racing you. is here to stay in Ontario. Thank you. Uh, when I stand, you sit. New question. The member from Bramley, Gordon Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. 
in the past. Yes, and so does the clear. member from Renfrew know the rules. When I ask for quiet, I should get it. Mr. Speaker, in the past, the government has made it clear that they don't legislate or even comment on issues that are still before the courts. Given that the issues between Elliston and their employees are still before the courts, why is this government changing the rules? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I know the Minister of Labour will want to comment on the supplementary, but I just want to be clear that the, uh, the divisional court the rendered a decision, Mr. Speaker, and so we are reviewing that decision. Sir, the environment and I think order. That the Minister of Labour made it very clear, Mr. Speaker, that we, uh, you know, as we understand it, the status quo can pertain vis-à-vis -vis Elliston, but there is uh, a 15-day, I believe. Uh, period where there may be an appeal, but the divisional court has re has rendered a decision, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, a question to again to the Premier. What we know is that the government is still trying to figure out the impact of this decision. For 10 long years, we've heard the courts used as an excuse by this government, whether it's the parents of children with autism fighting for IBI treatment or part-time college instructors looking for rights on the job. The Liberal government has hidden behind the phrase, it's before the courts. When, but when, the, when Ellis Don is fighting for a matter before the courts, the Liberals scramble to change the laws. Why? Minister of Labour. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Labor. First of all, uh, let's just state the fact again that this is a private member's bill that we're dealing with. This is not a government yes. bill, number one. Number two, as I mentioned earlier and as the Premier restated, that late Friday afternoon we have received a decision from the Divisional Court on the, on the, uh, to the decision of the Ontario La Labor Relations uh, Board. It's the decision is by three justices who reviewed the decision of the Ontario Labor Relations Board, and after thorough analysis, they have uh, quashed the decision that was made by the Ontario Labor, Labor Relations Board. In fact, they made the, applied the principle of stopple and made uh, the stopple a permanent. The decision came late Friday. We are, of course, very closely reviewing the decision. At the moment, I encourage the members opposite to read the decision as well. Thank you. Thank you. New question. The member from Ottawa, Orleans. <clears throat> Thank you, Speaker. My question through you is to the Minister of Rural Affairs. Minister, Ontario's small and rural communities have many unique and diverse challenges when it comes to infrastructure. Ensuring roads, bridges, and other critical infrastructure are maintained and upgraded requires significant investment, which many municipalities find costly. According to a recent City of Ottawa survey titled Building a Little Livable Ottawa, focus on rural issues, fixing and improving rural roads was identified as the main priority for residents. My constituents and residents across Ontario want to know how their government is supporting municipalities with these critical investments. Speaker, through you to the Minister of Rural Affairs, could the Minister please update the House on what our government is doing to help rural municipalities fund infrastructure projects? Minister of Rural Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member from Ottawa Orleans for his question. Investing in local infrastructure is critical for rural municipalities and one of our government's main priorities. In the 2013 budget, we announced a new $100 million fund for infrastructure in small, rural, and northern communities. Over the summer, my colleague, Minister Murray and I, crisscrossed Ontario, hosting 10 consultations to discuss the fund's scope and size. We heard from over 500 municipal representatives and logged nearly 50 hours of consultation. This is in addition to the nearly $90 million investments under the MIIII program announced this summer. These investments will help rural municipalities build roads, bridges, and other critical infrastructure to keep our communities moving forward. We'll have more to say on this in the coming days, Answer. Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you. Uh, thanks to the Minister for that answer. My constituents will be pleased to hear that our government is committed to investing in infrastructure. One of the main concerns I've heard has been a desire for a permanent, stable source of funding. As a consulting engineer, I work for many of these municipalities. They have prepared detailed, and as de detailed asset management plans, but now need the predictable funding associated with a permanent fund so they can better plan. Bringing this stability will allow small and rural municipalities to properly build and maintain key roads and bridges for years to come. Speaker, through you to the Minister of Rural Affairs, could the Minister please update the House on what our government is doing to ensure municipalities have stable, predictable funding for infrastructure? Minister. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I want to thank again the excellent member from Ottawa Orleans for a supplementary. We know that one of the main priorities of rural Ontario is predictable, stable funding. Premier Wynne stated her intention to make infrastructure funding permanent. We're looking to the advice we received over the summer 
as we build on what the Permanent Infrastructure Fund could look like. Our government is working with rural communities, providing the support they deserve. But, Mr. Speaker, don't take my word here. Here's what a very fine mayor from Aurelia said, Mayor Angela Orsi had to say, quote, I applaud the Wood government for reaching out to rural municipalities to understand their concerns with respect to infrastructure funding. I'm confident, Mr. Speaker, by working together, we can continue to strengthen rural communities through key investments in infrastructure. Answer. Thank you. Question, the member from Nipissing. Thank you, Speaker. Good morning. My question is for the Premier. Premier, on page 96 of your 2012 budget, it lists a savings of $265 million for the sale of Ontario Northland. But in a confidential advice to Cabinet, there was a document entitled Fiscal Implications at Variance from the 2012 Budget. It states you won't indeed save $265 million that was budgeted. Instead, it will cost you $790 million for this fire sale. Premier, that spread leaves a billion-dollar hole in your budget. According to the documents, you knew this when your 2013 budget was presented. So I'm asking you a simple question. When are you going to come clean with the taxpayers of Ontario about the billion-dollar hole in the, in the Liberal budget? Minister of Northern Development and Mines. Well, thank you very Northern much, Mr. Speaker. I'm glad to have an opportunity to, uh, to address this issue, particularly as I think uh, the member who is the approach has been uh, alarmist and not at all helpful, and by the way, not even remotely is, accurate in terms of how we are approaching the, uh, uh, the opportunity we have to transform the Ontario Northland Transportation Commission. Certainly when we were looking at uh, options for the ONTC, I think it's fair to say the government has a responsibility and a duty to assess all uh, associated liabilities. I think that would be described as a prudent part of uh, responsible governance. But the numbers that Mr. Uh, or the member Nipissing has been sharing um, would see absolutely no job uh, retention, no considerations about the socio-economic uh, considerations for the future of the thing. And this is, quite frankly, an alarmist depiction that doesn't in any way reflect the approach that we are taking towards the Ontario yes, and Transportation Commission. We recognize that the status quo is not going to work. We have a minister's advisory committee that's been set up to work Thank to make you. those decisions. And we're Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, let me tell you what is alarming. And what's alarming is that the Treasury told your government to defer the fire sale announcement and wait for, quote, further due diligence and analysis of fiscal implications. Speaker, those new numbers did come. And yes, they are alarming, Speaker. I'll give him that. Instead of the $25 million that the Liberals listed for severance, it's now listed at $250 million. And I say to you right here and now, that's still low by half. Uh, also, Speaker, they had absolutely no retirement benefits listed. They were not going to pay any benefits to any retirees. I stood and fought for those retirees, and now it's listed in the new documents as $56 million. Speaker, they showed Question. pensions at only $100 million when it's $200 million. In fact, it's $212. Do I need to go on and show how, why I'm so alarmed at the $790 million? When are you going to fix it? Please. Minister, we are talk what the member that's talking about is an, is an assessment of all the associated liabilities. If we absolutely shut the system down, something that was never the approach that we are going to take, certainly one that we're very, very keen to uh, make sure that we find a positive way to, to work our way through the challenges of the Ontario North End Transportation Commission. We are committed to a sustainable, efficient system, and we think there's some great opportunities for the ONTC. But again, the, the picture that the member from Nipissing has brought forward Attorney is not General, even remotely accurate representation of the approach we are taking, and certainly not the approach we are taking now. We are working through a ministerial advisory committee, and again, I've asked the member on a number of occasions to work with us, to provide a I cooperative approach. This, this approach Sorry, is one that is not helpful to the, to the ONTC employees, not helpful to the uh, municipalities that care so much, and I, I say on behalf Answer. of the ministerial advisory committee, I say on behalf of Mayor Al McDonald of North Bay and, and Mayor Spatchy, the president of Phenom, and others, work with us Thank to you. come up with a positive way. Thank you. New question. Member from Kitchener, Waterloo. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. 
The government now has a decision that makes it clear that Ellis Dawn, the Ellis Dawn bill is not an urgent matter, even for the well-connected company that asked for it. Whatever excuse the Premier had for rushing the bill ahead is falling apart. Will she clear things up today and stop pressing ahead with moves to ram it through? Minister, uh, government House Leader. Thank you very much. M Mr. Speaker, let's, let's review what's happening again. The member for Lambton, Kent, Middlesex has put forward a private member's bill. It has been debated here in the legislature. It is part of a larger programming motion, the same type of motion that the member's party pushed for for the financial accountability officer's legislation. There will be an opportunity, if this programming motion passes, for the bill to go to committee, where the issues that she has raised and her colleagues raised can be discussed, where there can be witnesses where there can be amendments and ultimately, Mr. Speaker, a vote on all aspects of the bill. Then it will come back here where there'll be more discussion and votes. Mr. Speaker, this is a private member's bill and it will be looked at thoroughly by the committee. Answer. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The government can't have it both ways. If this bill isn't an urgent matter, if it's before the courts, why won't she clear things up today and make it clear that she won't proceed with this undemocratic legislation? Else, Mr. Speaker, the honourable member can't have it both ways. All of a sudden, programming motions are horrible unless the NDP proposes the programming motion. Mr. Speaker, we have put together a set of eight bills in which there is some consensus within the legislature. One of them is a private member's bill for the member from uh, Lambton, Kent, Middlesex. There are other bills too, Mr. Speaker, as well as the formation of a special committee to look at developmental services. Can't have the debate going on between the members that are asking the question and the members that are answering. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, I think it is very important to stress all this programming motion does is allow for further debate and discussion and votes on all these matters and any issues that the honourable member or any honourable member in this legislature has can be raised if and when it goes before committee. Thank you. New question. The member for Scarborough Agent Court. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Children and Youth Services. Our government has made priority to invest in youth throughout the province, Mr. Speaker. In my riding of Scarborough Agent Court, there are many creative and talented youth who would like to make a difference in the community. Mr. Speaker, the minister recently announced an exciting partnership with Mars. This is to create a studio-wide Ontario Social Impact and Leadership Academy. Mr. Speaker, through you to the minister, can she please inform the House this partnership gives the youth opportunity to make a positive impact in the community, but also how does this program work, Mr. Speaker? Thank you. Minister, Thank you. Thank Minister you to the Children member for the question, and uh, I'm pleased to be able to stand to speak a bit about Studio Y, which we just uh, announced last week. I agree with the member that there are many youth, not just in her riding, but all across the province, that are talented, well-educated, with a strong desire to make a positive impact in their communities. Our government wants to identify and refine that talent to this so their great ideas can become reality. I'm proud to say that we are supporting Mars with uh, launching Studio Y, Ontario's impact and leadership ac activity designed to educate young leaders in social innovation and really help them grow their great ideas. Every year, 25 youth aged 18 to 29 from across the province, not just from Toronto, but across the province, will be yes, selected sir. from Mars to take part in this nine-month program. They'll receive intensive training and mentoring. Mr. Speaker, this really is an investment in our future and in our Thank you. Your a supplementary. To hear that we are supporting social innovation throughout this province. Ontario youth are recognized as some of the best educated in the world, Mr. Speaker. And today our page, Daniel, goes to Kennedy Public School, my riding of Scarborough Asian Course, recognized as the number one elementary school in the system, Mr. Speaker. And that's another great thing I want to promote. 
They are talented, global-minded, and passionate about making a difference, Mr. Speaker. Investing in leadership skills will help these young people become social entrepreneurs, change agents, and civic leaders of tomorrow, Mr. Speaker. Creating a highly skilled workforce is important to every Ontarian in this competing era of globalization. I'm pleased to see that we are partnering with Mars as they have proven track records of driving social innovations and economic Question. prosperity. Mr. Speaker, through you to the um, minister, is how is the studio-wide strengthened Ontario's social innovation culture? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Speaker, and I agree. We do have a fantastic education system here, and again, talent and creativity across the province. The, uh, the curriculum in Studio Y will help build on that education and that strength to help youth turn their business ideas into reality. There's, there's three essential components to this intensive nine-month program. The first three months, youth will learn about governance, business planning, negotiated and communication skills. The next four months will help them use those skills in real-life situations, working with enterprises or other organizations in their communities. Then there will be a team project in the last two months. It's certainly an exciting initiative and one that I wish was around when I was younger. Applications for Studio Y, just so everyone knows, open tomorrow online at studio.marcde.com. The first group of young people will begin in January, and I can't wait to see the creativity and the environment that's created through this project. Thank you. New question? Member from Ottawa. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Transportation. Minister, as you're well aware, there is an ongoing study on the 401 expansion going through the region of Durham. The difficulty that it has caused is shut down all development in the area until such time as the study is completed. Now, the problem is complicated in such that, Minister, your senior ministerial individuals have come to the City Council and explained to the City Council that there will be no expansion until the year 2030 or 2031 through the area. The difficulty is that I have developers in the area who are waiting to build and have permits waiting to go until they get the okay from the Ministry of Transportation. Minister, what's happening with these permits and the expansion in the area? Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, just first to give some context to this, we, we not only have one of the biggest transit builds out, we're spending more on highway expansion than ever before. Our, our annual highway budget, Mr. Speaker, now is an unprecedented $2.6 billion. I also want to compliment the federal government. You know I've been critical of them when they're not a partner. Certainly on the 407, the, the federal government has been a good partner on that project, and we're trying to advance that project. I realize that the highway and transportation right-of-ways do cause problems for development. I'm not particularly familiar with the details. I accept uh, uh, that there's some validity to the concern you're raising. I will happily meet with you and with the municipalities Operation. to try and resolve it, and I greatly appreciate Answer. you raising the issue. Thank you. Leader of the third party on a point of order. Speaker, I move unanimous consent that the provisions of Government Order No. 8 relating to Bill 74 be deleted. The leader of the third party is seeking unanimous consent to delete a portion of the programming motion. Do we agree? I heard a no. A point of order from the member from Mississauga Streetsville. Uh, speaker, I'm uh, pleased to introduce in the um, West Visitors Gallery Bernard Jordan and his wife, who are from Meadowvale. He's the president of the Meadowvale Senior Citizens Club, wow. and he's here for Senior Citizens Day. Welcome wow. to Queen's Park. The minister responsible for seniors on a point of order. Um, speaker, uh, in the audience, we also have a constituent of mine from your quest, Omalola Are. Welcome. There are no further votes deferred. There is no further deferred vote, so this House stands adjourned until 1 p.m. this afternoon.